everybody. Well, May is such a busy month and we've got so much to talk to you about it. So I'm just going to jump right into it. First of all, this Saturday, May the 14th is Global Big Day. This is when the whole world gets together and counts birds. You don't have to go anywhere fancy or too far. You can just count birds from your home for about five to 10 minutes, as long as you enter them with eBird. Or if it's a nice day and you feel like walking and checking out birds somewhere else, you can submit as many checklists as you want. Have fun, everyone. Second thing on our agenda is uh, bird migration, which is full on right now, and window strikes. Anita Coogan and her colleague Peter Monty shared this video with us. Anita and Peter go downtown New York every fall and every spring, and they try to rescue as many birds as they can. These birds end up hitting those tall glass buildings. Some of them survive, some of them don't. Here's an extract from the video. Oh no, right behind me. I just heard this bird hit. Oh my god. This just happened right behind me. I heard it hit the glass and it dropped right behind me. Almost hit me. I'm not sure what this is. I hope this one survives. It hit pretty hard. PSG. This is the one that was squeaking. Don't hurt him. And here's the one that was pretty much dead. I only knew that his breathing was breathing. So this is just a reminder to please turn off your exterior lights if you're not using them. If you like to stay up late at night, please close your blinds and your curtains. And perhaps if you work in a building that has lots of windows or the lights are turned on for the night, maybe you can talk to the building owner and persuade them to turn them off for the migration time. You know, any turned off light will be beneficial to migratory birds. And another thing to keep an eye on is window reflections in your buildings, in your house. For example, here we have to change the location of our bird feeding station every spring and every fall because the light changes. We also use our backyard a lot more in the summer. So we're in and out of the house, the dog is in and out of the house. So whenever we open the patio door, the birds just get spooked and boom, they go straight into our patio door. So this is what I'm doing today. I'm taking down my bird feeding station and I'm moving it all the way to the back of our property, closer to that overgrown wild area that we have, because I find that migratory birds actually love coming to my bird feeders more in that area than when the feeders are left closer to the house. When Steve Bigler sent me a picture of an American robin munching on a bunch of hulled sunflower seeds, I was uh, a bit surprised because this has never happened to me in my backyard. So, of course, I forwarded the picture to David to ask him what this robin was up to. Hi, Tatiana. I have to admit that your photo of the American robin eating sunflower seeds at a feeder may be a little misleading to those feeding birds in the backyard, mainly because we both know that a robin's typical diet is about 40% invertebrates and 60% fruits. And as such, they don't usually frequent our feeders. Some of the more common invertebrates eaten by robins include earthworms, insect larvae, grubs, caterpillars, and snails, and occasionally spiders, beetles, grasshoppers, and the like. As for fruits, their favorites are blueberries, cherries, grapes, uh, crab apples, mulberries, winterberries, and dogwood berries. However, American robins are quite omnivorous and they have been recorded munching on eggs, small snakes, frogs, lizards, and even tiny fish. Now looking at that photo very carefully, I can see that this particular robin is dining upon hull sunflower seeds, which is something they will occasionally eat. You see, robins do not have bills that are designed to easily crack open the hulls of sunflower seeds. So that exercise simply becomes too much work and thus less desirable in their daily diet. So don't waste your time with niger seed, safflower seed, cracked corn, or mixed bird seed trying to get robins to your feeders. If you do want to attract them to feeders, offer things like chunks of fruit like pears and apples, softened raisins and cranberries on a platform tray or dish. Robins will also come to suet, but only if it's broken up in some way. Peanut hearts and jelly will work too. 
As insect eaters, they love mealworms, especially live wriggling ones bought from a pet store. I suppose earthworms from a fish bait store would also work, but that could get a tad expensive. Finally, we must keep in mind that birds are like people. They can behave quite individualistically and thus surprise us with their behavior from time to time. Well, here's some very interesting news in the bird world. A team of researchers from the National Aviary in Pittsburgh spent three years combing an undisclosed portion of Louisiana woodland and now claim that the ivory-billed woodpecker is not extinct. They used audio recordings, trail cameras, and even a drone to capture photos of the bird. In fact, Steve Lada, the leader of the team and director of conservation at the aviary, said that each member of his team actually had encounters with the big woodpecker and often heard its call. Lada himself saw the bird fly upwards in front of him for six to eight seconds, showing the distinctive white edges to its wings. He added that the size and markings of the bird captured in the photo provide strong evidence that it was not a pileated or a red-headed woodpecker. What makes this finding so intriguing is the fact that last year the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service officially declared the bird to be extinct. Moreover, a few years before that, a team of ornithologists from the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology claimed to have rediscovered the bird, but didn't have enough definitive proof to convince independent experts on bird identification. The last accepted sighting of the ivory billed woodpecker was in 1944, based on a series of grainy pictures and actual observations. The bird was once relatively common, stretching from the Carolinas through Florida to Texas. But human impacts upon their habitats, as well as killing them for food, followed by the inevitable ramped up collecting due to their rare status, caused the birds to become extremely secretive and totally avoid humans. While the study hasn't yet been peer reviewed, Lattice team has already attracted one strong supporter, Dr. Jeff Hill of Auburn University, who firmly believes that there's still several dozen ivory bills hiding out in the swamps. Stay tuned. Blue colors of indigo and lazuli buntings are so vibrant that you'll know it's once you see one. So indigo buntings live and breed in eastern parts of North America and lazuli buntings are more on the west coast. Though somewhere in the middle, they overlap and each bird fiercely defends its territory. And then somewhere in western parts, these birds tend to interbreed. Believe it or not, both lazuli and indigo buntings belong to the cardinal family together with rose-breasted grosbeaks, tanagers, and everybody's favorite, the northern cardinal. In this family, all males are bright and colorful, whereas females wear a duller, more brownish coat. Both lazuli and indigo buntings happily visited bird feeders a few years ago. We were lucky enough to get a male indigo bunting on our Niger feeder. He stayed there for a few days. That was actually right after we'd moved our bird feeding station to the back of our property, where we have this overgrown shrubby um, area. So Niger and thistle seed are very popular with these birds, but white millets and sunflower seeds are never turned down. Buntings migrate during the night and male buntings are actually arriving in their breeding grounds as we speak. Females will follow them in just a few days. So keep your eyes peeled and your ears tuned, especially if you have those overgrown shrubby areas in your neighborhood or in your backyard, because male buntings will sing profusely for a very long time. Indigo bunting pairs remain monogamous pretty much for the whole season and they can have up to three to four uh, broods. Female look for nesting sites and they really like these overgrown thorny areas. So if you have wild uh, raspberries or wild blackberries, don't rush to cut them down. This is the kind of habitat that females really like to build their nests in. She lays about three to four eggs and chicks fledge when they're nine to 14 days old. And talk about hardworking parents or actually hardworking moms, female indigo buntings do it all. Males don't get involved with either rearing or taking care of their females. 
and their offspring. And indigo buntings can live up to 11 years old. You know, I've had bluebird boxes up for a few years now, and even though I know that I have too many trees and just my backyard is not the kind of habitat that they prefer, I'm still being hopeful. I just really like bluebirds, so the thrush family photo contest was quite a treat for me. Let's check out the top five. Here's the third place, the second place, and the grand prize winner. Congratulations, everybody. Just a quick reminder, if you take the first place in our photo contest, we ask you not to participate for the rest of the year. The grand prize winner gets what we call our bird food court. It's a Squirrel Buster Plus with a weather guard, a pole adapter, and a seed buster detachable tray. Well, June is when birds are busy raising their young, so the theme of our June photo contest is hardworking parents. Good luck, everyone. All right, everyone, time to say goodbye. Enjoy the spring migration and all the beautiful birds that it brings. I'll catch you in two weeks.